Most Australians have no savings at all. And only 38% reported actually having more than $5,000 in total in savings, which is pretty poor. And 23% of those respondents admitted that they could not find or raise $2,000 in a week for something that was urgent and important if they desperately needed it. Let's put these numbers into perspective. The rule of thumb for emergency savings is that you should have a minimum of three months of living expenses in your bank account at any given time. So right now, the average household in Australia, for example, spends about $74,301 on general household living costs. And if you're in America, that number's somewhere around $63,168. And for people in the UK, it's about 45,636 pounds. What that means in real terms is that the average person listening right now to this podcast should have at least $18,575 or £11,409 in your three-month emergency fund. And I'm guessing that many of you don't because this is what the stats are showing us. This lack of emergency savings and the inability to quickly raise funds for unexpected necessities, such as maybe a replacement fridge, tires for your car, or maybe breakdown repairs, or even dental, dental surgery, medical expenses. It really sets the stage for what I want to talk about today, which is the disturbing, highly disturbing surge in buy now, pay later funding schemes, such as Zip, Afterpay, and Kalarna. Those are the big brands that everybody should be familiar with. The market for these buy now, pay later types of schemes is expected to grow by 10 to 15 times by 2025, according to the Bank of America. The UK market alone is set to double next year after one in four British citizens spent 2.3 billion pounds in buy now, pay later debt just in this last Christmas period. Think about it. That's nearly 40% of all Christmas shopping in that country was done on buy now, pay later. Now, in Australia, 21% of buy now, pay later customers are missing payments, 21%. And that has actually boosted the revenue for these payment providers by 38%. And there's no clear regulation to protect consumers who may be vulnerable and susceptible to default due to maybe their age or even their inexperience with managing debt. You know, one in 10 people using these services already have debts in arrears elsewhere according to a wide-ranging FCA review into credit services. There can be little doubt that this buy now, pay later model encourages consumerism. And there's quite a bit of data that suggests a large majority of the items being purchased are either luxury, pure discretionary, or both. 90% of some of these purchases involve fashions and footwear, right? We're not talking about um, replacement refrigerators or medical procedures here. And it's leading to some really bad financial outcomes for a large number of consumers, particularly younger consumers. Now, our guest today came onto my radar recently when I read a post on LinkedIn where he pitched a really cool new concept called Save Now, Buy Later. And it's a product that he's actually building in his company, Bamboo, which is based in Singapore. You essentially save now to some third-party escrow account, and the item gets shipped only when you've saved up the total amount and you can pay it in full. And his model, the save now, pay later, also allows consumers to cancel at any time for a full refund if they decide to change their mind and they don't want to make the purchase or they want to direct the money to be placed or spent elsewhere. So I want to bring Aki up. Aki Rannan isn't a finance guy, and that's what makes it's so cool to talk to him about this stuff. You know, he started his career at a very early age, building computers and then coding. For two decades, his job was to design and build websites and apps for other companies. And eventually that path led him to Singapore, where he faced a really unique problem. He had sold his house in his native Finland, and he thought that he should probably invest the money in some, you know, shape or form. He was amazed, astounded at the lack of options, the tremendous costs and the digital experiences that were offered by most of the banks. And he decided that he's going to do something about it. He's going to build something better. Today, his company, Bamboo, actually helps the banks offer really simple savings and investing solutions to consumers 
through his automated online platform. So I'm really excited to have you here today, Aki. Oh, my pleasure, Rondalyn. Hey, let's get stuck into it because I know that you and I kind of have a lot of ground to cover. If 20 to 21% of consumers are defaulting on these payment schemes, and that has directly led to a 38% increase in revenue for these buy now, pay later companies, doesn't that sort of suggest that they're actually incentivized to approve customers who they know are going to default? Yeah, I guess the uh, overall problem here, this is not specific necessarily to buy now, pay later. I think it's a general problem in in finance, but there's a clear loophole or, or gap in the regulations where this kind of incentive misalignment is possible. And, you know, the reason it's been such a tremendous growth journey is that the merchants, so the sort of, you know, online shops where people are buying these, these shoes and clothes that they, they don't need, they're the ones that have good alignment incentives with these payment platforms because they're sort of both winning together the consumer is not. The consumer is losing at the end of the day. But in some sense, that's allowed within the current regulations, um, which certainly makes the whole thing feel, you know, too good to be true and reminiscent of some of the other, you know, massive uh, VC fueled growth journeys that we've seen in the past few years, like uh, vaping and uh, obviously like the the e bike explosion which happened and, and fizzled and you know people lost a lot of fortunes but it, it has that same sort of feel where it's just like too good to be true and these new platforms are coming up like mushrooms after rain and in every country and every market there's now some sort of you know emerging buy now pay later scheme banks are getting in on it the tech giants are getting in on it um, and i think it's just an unfortunate thing because again as you you said rightly um it's the consumer who loses here Yeah, well, look, obviously the fintechs are winning because they're making huge profits off of whether people pay or they don't pay because they're getting paid on both ends of the spectrum. Clearly, the retailers are winning. Some of the retailers have posted the highest sales growth in decades during the COVID period. And I think it can largely be attributed to people, you know, being at home and maybe wanting a better TV or, you know, looking around and wanting to spend money and actually going out and using these buy now, pay later schemes to do it. Yeah. I mean, effectively, you know, I I think there's a complicated kind of psychology around the pandemic and spending, but I I think, you know, you can ask friends and whoever, I think it's very consistent in different markets and different, you know, income brackets that generally people were spending more during the pandemic. So, you know, is it a combination of just being bored being a little sad, trying to cheer yourself up. Um, obviously, a lot of the retailers probably getting more aggressive on their marketing kind of to seize the opportunity, given that people couldn't travel, et cetera. So it was kind of like, you know, if you're not going to travel, what are you going to do? You want to do something nice. And therefore, you know, the logical thing, I guess, <laughs> is to uh, spend more. So certainly they, they have, um, I would say, t- taken advantage of the opportunity and sadly, from the sort of consumer's point of view, because it seems by and large, because of the lack of regulation, there's also not really sharing between credit agencies and these platforms, and certainly not between the different platforms. So, for example, if you open an account with Afterpay and Klarna, certainly, yes, they can they can both shut you down if you don't make your payments and they can send that to debt collectors. But when you open a new account with, say, yet another buy now, pay later platform, they won't know that you've already defaulted on your payments with the other two guys. So in some sense, the more of these platforms are coming on, it's almost like you can get a new credit card every time and there's no credit checks, nothing that is sort of stopping you because they've designed the whole user journey to be like, you know, you go on your your favorite shop and there's a button right there next to the price. And it's almost like it's free because it's like, well, I can have what I want right now, you know, ship same day, same day delivery. Um, and then I can worry about it tomorrow. And sadly, you know, it's, it's not just by now there's a pay later, uh, <laughs> in the name uh, and the, and the fine print. So, so I think sadly, you know, as you opened up with the, the British stats on, on the Christmas spending, um, there's a lot of people now, in the UK wondering how they're going to make those payments. Uh, you know, that, that later is coming uh, eventually. 
So how did these buy now, pay later providers kind of avoid having to report this stuff to the credit reporting bureaus? Because clearly credit cards have to do it. How did they fly under the radar or get around these loopholes? Yeah, well, you know, without knowing the, the specifics, because they obviously depend uh, on each country, but it seems to be like a, a global phenomenon in the sense that probably the, the regulations around credit and debt and credit cards, they've been there for, you know, decades. So they're well established and probably relatively harmonized and consistent because you've got the global players, MasterCard, Visa, you know, American Express in all of the major countries. And so they've sort of been doing the same thing for a long time. And I think like in a lot of other fintech categories, if you remember a couple of years ago, another one, one of these big sort of explosions was peer-to-peer lending, which was then consequently uh, shut down in a lot of countries because they realized like, hold on, this is way too good to be true. We're sort of offering, you know, investors double digit returns uh, and, and, you know, basically giving money to small businesses that, you know, aren't really credit checked. And there was, you know, in China, especially there was rampant kind of, um, effectively fraud schemes built around this. Uh, and therefore, I think it, it has that similar vibe where it's like, okay, there was this kind of hole in the regulations which allowed this technically to happen. So therefore, with you know, fueled with VC money, there, there's been this kind of blitzscaling to attack this, this kind of you know, regulatory arbitrage opportunity um, while it's open because you don't know how long it's last and, and you know, it's going to last and, and what is going to be the regulatory backlash. So I think right now everybody's probably waiting for one of these major markets, whether it's UK, Australia, to set a precedent. Um, and after that, then I think it starts to kind of harmonize very quickly across markets. And that's that's exactly what we've seen, I think, in the past two, three years with uh, other categories, like, again, um, peer-to-peer lending. Well, it's, been, it's been about three and a half years three, four years now that we've had these buy now, pay later providers, and yet the regulations haven't moved. Yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, I think Klarna, one of the originals, if not the original, has been around for even much longer. Um, And and so I I think it's just that now it's become like a systemic uh, problem, if you will. I think it was sort of under the radar that, you know, because you've had things like payday loans uh, in that sort of same space for, for many years um, but I think it's it's never really sort of moved the needle on a societal level. And perhaps it was triggered again by the pandemic and the sort of stay at home and, and kind of spending um, e-commerce binge that we all went on. But now it's really moving the needle that you can actually see, you know, these these figures of just one market over basically one month period adding two point three billion uh, in debt. You know, these are not small numbers. These are going to show up uh, big time. And will affect, for example, how credit is done in the future. And and that's where I think there's a certain sense right now, because there is no clear regulation, that there's kind of like a, you know, if you can't beat them, join them mentality that even in in Australia, I've seen some of the banks are now, you know, joining the fray with their own offerings, because certainly there is a sense in which if this continues unchecked, this is the new form of credit. So it is effectively a danger to the, the existing credit card. Uh, market share because especially the young people are you know that potentially don't even qualify for credit cards uh, sadly do qualify for these buy now pay later platforms yeah I think that's a really important point to make right I think the stats are saying that sort of one in ten people that are applying for these cards are already in default on something else but I bet there's that bigger percentage that couldn't even qualify for a credit card because if they did, their credit score wouldn't afford them enough points, yeah. you know, and 20 to 21% of these consumers are defaulting, you know? So it's interesting because there are no regulations to, you know, kind of protect the consumers when they get in, but guess what? When they are defaulting, you can bet that these companies are sending them to debt collection. You can bet that they are petitioning these people into bankruptcy. You can, you know, bet that the financial and long-term implications for the people who are defaulting are quite significant and they can't even go to an ombudsman or anyone for any kind of relief. Yeah. And I think that that's why now it, it has the feel of a, a big problem in the making because there's kind of a long tail to how this works. 
Um, and, you know, it's in some sense, it's like the perfect MBA business model that from a revenue generation and profit point of view, you're, you're sort of hitting the ground running immediately. And, you know, you can grow the business very quickly because there's so much kind of rampant demand for this sort of consumerism. And there's so much like online shopping, a lot of like grocery shopping, like everything's sort of moving to online shopping. So you're sort of adding these buy now, pay later buttons um, all over the place. So that, that, that sort of, you might say, inflow of debt has happened very quickly. But the sort of long tail of the debt collection and defaults um, and ultimately, you know, bankruptcy, bankruptcy, that's kind of still not really showing. You know what I mean? Because people people obviously love sharing the, you know, Instagram photos of the new Yeezys that they've just uh, bought on money that they don't have, but they don't post that, you know, the debt collector is now at the door. So there's, there's sort of a f- false visibility to this whole thing where people are trying to portray a certain lifestyle which they can't afford uh, but the reality is not as fun and nobody wants to put that on Facebook yeah maybe maybe social media and in particular Instagram and platforms like that are perhaps bigger contributors or drivers to this than even the pandemic yeah yeah you know I'm sure there will be reports coming out of this but certainly you know the Instagram monetizing through uh, effectively their e-commerce platform where you see, you know, a social media influencer, maybe one of the Kardashians advertising their makeup or clothing lines or whatever they're being paid for. And, you know, they, they've placed the, the buy button within the photo so that you can tag the, the Gucci belts and, and whatever, right from the photo, go directly to a uh, e-commerce fulfillment site with conveniently placed buy now, pay later buttons and off you go. Really, it's the sort of, I don't know, you know, people used to talk about sort of this um, uh, spur of the moment buying kind of impulse purchases. It's, it's always been a problem, even before you know, e-commerce and stuff. But uh, Amazon, I think, is the first one where it sort of became like a digital thing where people would sort of buy stuff they don't need, similar with like eBay. But this was before we were sort of enabling this habitual overspending with this sort of lever of debt. Previously, you had to actually have the money in, for example, your PayPal account or something like that. You had to have the cash, but now you don't. Now you can sort of make the spur of the moment, you know, swipe left purchase of things you can't afford and, you know, worry about it later, potentially have your parents worry about it later, given that, you know, quite a lot of these people are relatively young. Yeah, well, what... What do you think of some of these self-proclaimed ethical buy now, play, pay later platforms? Yeah, well, at the end of the day, you know, I'm not a buy now, pay later entrepreneur myself, so I don't claim to be an expert in the the mechanics or, or you know, the, the inner workings of the business model. You know, I just out of interest, um, I have looked at some of the terms and conditions, and certainly there are a few platforms which seem to make the genuine case that they, for example, don't charge late fees. So the idea being that you simply say, well, you've sort of got a thousand dollars or something like that. That's your, you know, total spend that you can make on our platform. If you don't follow the payment plan, which is something like say, you know, you split that into three monthly um, invoices. If you miss those, then you're sort of off, meaning immediately, you know, you don't get any more. We don't charge you any late fees either, but then they're going to sort of contact you and try to work out like, how can you pay them back? Now, at the end of the day, you know, these, these are genuine businesses, so they're not going to let you off the hook. It's not free money. There is the, the pay later element there. So I think between the lines, even the, the, the most transparent and sort of least profiteering of the platforms, the reality is that like they are enabling a bad habit of spending too much. And so therefore even even the most honest of these will have to move that to a debt collector who will come to your home and they will take your sofa and your TV and whatever, you know, your new iPhone 12 pro or whatever, they will take your stuff because you didn't make those payments. So there's not like a get out of jail free card attached to this business model. Yeah. But what are the alternatives? You know, how are we going to teach people to start saving up to purchase instead of encouraging them constantly and incentivizing them to spend money they don't have on stuff they don't need. Yeah, you know, this is this is a really tough one. It's not a new problem. It's as probably old as time because, 
if you look at somebody like Warren Buffett, you know, many times richest man in the world, like, oh, you know, how is he doing it? Is he such a genius? Well, he just buys stocks and he never sells them. It seems like ludicrously simple. So like theoretically, anybody could do the same. And his his idea, you know, I read his uh, biography where he talks about this this sort of statement that he would constantly make to himself, which is like, hey, should I buy this thing? And so let's let's imagine he's like buying like a, a new tie, which costs like, I don't know, 50 bucks. So then he would think, OK, I have the 50 bucks. I could make this payment now. But if instead I just bought more stock with this $50, how much is it going to be worth in 10, 20, 30, 50 years? And so that's that's been his mentality. The problem is almost none of us was wired and born the way Warren Buffett is. So like we, we never make that mental calculus, which is, yes, there's an exponential um uh, in that equation through the, uh, the effectively the rate of return that you're assuming from your investment. So it's not maybe that easy to make that mental arithmetic, but people refuse to do it even if they have a calculator on their phone. They simply ignore their future selves. This, this is not a new phenomenon. It's, it's pretty well established in psychology um, that people, people sort of refute their own self-interest, meaning that they place very little value. In, in fact, it's a hyperbolic discounting of their future self. So you could think of it in any terms. You could think of it in monetary terms or in pain or, or pleasure. So it's, it's today, right now, instant gratification is really what we make our decisions based upon. So even if it's like, oh, I could have $1,000 now, a million dollars in you know, 50 years, Sadly, most people are going to take the thousand dollars right now. It, it, it makes absolutely no sense. But th this is sort of the implicit decision making that we're constantly making. So how do we switch that around? It's I think it's a very difficult, nuanced psychological problem. And sadly, I think one of the ways in which you know there's going to be more demand for something as an alternative to this is when it gets really bad. You know, when you start seeing the the statistics coming out of you know, what is the sort of chaos and, and um, uh, sad stories, frankly, created by this sort of rampant consumerism that, that we couldn't afford, especially during the time of the pandemic, when, you know, there's unemployment and uncertainty about the future. We are, we're amassing more debt than ever. It, it's just unsustainable. So sadly, I think many people are going to have to suffer before that we start having this general switch in consumer sentiment where people start saying, hey, you know, saving is actually pretty sexy. It's pretty cool. It's not just sexy to post your new Gucci loafers on Instagram. It's actually sexy to, you know, have money and be responsible, not, you know, default on your lifestyle and actually, you know, plan for the future and, and have a financially successful and sustainable life where you're not constantly competing with people you don't even know on Instagram, but sort of competing with yourself and, and just trying to improve yourself. So I think there's a bit of a subculture around that. You know, there are forums and Reddit sub subreddits um, that are into that type of thing, but it's, it's a slow shift. So I think if, if we want to solve this right now, I think it has to be a combination of regulation, meaning the, the too good to be true business model does need to be, if not shut down, it has to be limited in some respect because, again, the the incentives for the fintechs, the investors who are fueling it, the merchants, it's sort of overwhelmingly tipping the scales to where it's it's like even if the consumer loses, there's always the next dummy in line. If you know what I mean, you know, even if your existing client base is now debt ridden and you know can't buy more stuff, there's more suckers coming into the line than you can actually service. So we have to have to tip the scales with regulation. I think that needs to be part of it. But then, you know, there are, it's, it's not like this idea of, you know, saving rather than spending something that I've personally invented. I think it's been, you know, it's, it's kind of common sense and therefore common knowledge. But because it's, it's not obvious how you would do that and especially obvious how you would compete with this sort of, of massively incentivized uh, spending scheme, it's tricky. And therefore, you know, nobody's going to fund that uh, currently. So I, I think we need to craft something where, where there's some sort of psychological hook and reward attached to the saving, which could be something like potentially 
you know, because, for example, buy now, pay later is not exactly cheap, even though the incentives are there to boost revenue. It is potentially a multiple times more expensive to the merchant. So like the e-commerce sites uh, than traditional well, credit cards. And to consumers, right? Well, you know, they're building but, that price into their overall price, which means you and I are paying it, even if we're not buy now, pay later customers. Well, not it's necessarily. The price that yeah, not necessarily. I mean, it seems like according to the reports, that's that's kind of a potential chink in the armor is that it's a trade off for the merchant in terms of, hey, do I want to capture more revenue growth with a lower margin? So the, their margin for buy now, pay later is a little bit smaller than it is for traditional credit cards. But of course, Right now, they're sort of willing to take the trade off and, and, you know, capture more sales, more revenue to fuel their own company growth. But I think there could be something there where potentially if we could at least have the consumer win, meaning in the sense that we're not increasing their debt, and potentially could we introduce some sort of minor savings element that if there's a there's a yield on the savings plan, there's a discount on the sales because there's basically no middleman necessarily there to take margin because of the debt and the cost of debt, um, that could, could we sort of make it where it could be potentially cheaper for the merchant and cheaper for the consumer. So I think you need something to balance the scales because if it's purely like, oh, you know, do I want to wait six months or do I want to have it shipped in the next two hours? The, the weakness in all of us humans uh, won't won't go for that option very much. You know, one in a hundred might, but that's not really gonna gonna tip the scale. So there's some guys like uh, Sally May in the U.S. You know, one of the old financial institutions. They launched something called Smarty Pig, uh, and they're trying to position that as this sort of alternative to buy now pay later, which is you know what they're calling save then spend. Um, I I think I have the better. Uh, <laughs> Um, name with save now and, and uh, buy later. I think it's more directly Amen. comparable. But you know, I, you know, my, my post on this topic and our, our sort of desire to offer something like this as an alternative. Uh, I, I think it at least got some attention within the community. I think there are like-minded entrepreneurs, uh, bankers, potentially even investors who sort of see that. This, this can't really be sustainable. This is a little bit too good to be true. So therefore, we're going to have to have some more common sense, you know, long-termist uh, alternative to this. So we'll see how this end, ends up. But I, I, I think it is worth trying um, because it's only going to get worse before it gets better. Well, one of the things I noticed, because obviously I've been in the coaching game for a long time, right? One of the things I've noticed with clients is when we are working together and I'm teaching them to put between three and six months of their fixed monthly expenditures into a savings account, invariably at the boat, maybe fourth or fifth month of savings, the client hits that tipping point, right? Where they start to see that they've got huge sums of cash amounting or amassing in this savings account. And it, there is that tipping point where the client becomes reluctant to spend the money, right? Yeah. So at the beginning, people want to spend and spend and spend because that's what they've always done. But when they actually start to see fifty or $100,000 saved up in that savings account, something in their mind changes, right? Their psychology around this changes and they get protective over that money that they have. And they start to make far better decisions about what they're going to spend that money on, if at all, right? You know, oftentimes I'm now even seeing some of my clients who are getting, you know, quite large sums of money in these accounts. They're much more reluctant to spend it on stuff that they don't need. Yeah, that they've formed a habit around saving and the gratification is looking at their account and seeing, you know, the four or five digit sums, which they've never seen there before. And they're sort of proud of that. And, you know, obviously at that point, it will override the, instinct or the temptation to erode that accomplishment by, you know, spending it on things which perhaps start to feel a little silly suddenly. But the, the trick is, of course, that, you know, it required you, the coach, to sort of be there and, and get them to do that. But, you know, can we have a coach for everybody? And is everybody willing to commit to such a program? And I think that's that's where the trick is, because this buy now, pay later thing has spread like wildfire. So it's, you know, we're talking about tens, hundreds of millions of consumers who are now being exposed to this temptation 
And so therefore, I think the solution has to be something equivalently mm, digital and automated. But I think, you know, one thing that does give me a little bit of hope is also the emergence of high yield savings accounts. Um, also in the UK, in the US, so you know where you get maybe two two percent returns or roughly there thereabouts uh, on an annual basis, which isn't like a tremendous amount. But if if the experience and the the onboarding is almost as easy as spending, meaning you can open up these accounts with an app and you can easily move money in and out instantaneously. There's no fees associated, so it starts to feel like it's something where you know even though the two percent is such a small amount. If you're accruing some sort of interest, you put in, you know, a hundred dollars or a hundred pounds, whatever, a month, and then you see, hold on, now it's more than a hundred, so it's actually growing just because I left it there for a month. I think it's these kind of subtle cues that we need to sort of get people to engage with and try and sort of compare. You know, do I feel better having spent something, gotten some sort of consumer merchandise now in my hand, but then sort of hanging the, having the long term hanging guilt of having incurred more debt versus sort of the delayed gratification of seeing over, you know, a period of several months accumulating savings and sort of being proud that now I'm in in this sort of better financial position. So I think that counter trend of high yield savings could be kind of a saving grace that at least people have a sort of choice to make. Do I go left? Do I go right? Um, and, and if both are equally easy, they're, they're at least on some sort of level playing field and can be uh, part of the solution. Yeah, perhaps we need to offer something like better pricing. So if people are participating in these savings schemes, maybe they get better pricing when they go to spend the money. Yeah, and it actually brings to mind a good example. In fact, one of the original high yield um, savings schemes was by Alibaba in China. They, in fact, had the world's largest money market fund at the time, which they I think they grew from zero to more than 100 billion um, in record time. It was like, I want to say something like, uh, I'll have to check it, but I want to say it was it was definitely less than two years. It might have even been less than a year. So it's sort of outrageous. And you ask, well, how did they accumulate, you know, $100 billion of savings for people? And the way they did it was pretty ingenious in that it was integrated into their e-commerce platform. So when people bought stuff using Alipay, if they returned the money, instead of getting the cash in their bank account, they automatically put it into this high yield savings account. So then people could still take it out. But what they found is most people didn't. They sort of said, okay, I'll I'll park the money there because I'm getting some sort of Uh, interest on this money. And if I ever need it, I can easily just kind of get it out. And most people didn't. They actually put more and more money into it. And it sort of (laughs) went into this exponential growth mode. And I think it's these kind of stories that are very encouraging. But sadly, the regulators actually stepped in and shut it down partially because it became so large that they felt it was starting to be like a systemic risk to the, (laughs) the financial system in China, because there was so much money going into this um, money market fund. So ironically, regulate, regulators had to step in to sit, you know, basically stop people from saving. And now we're sort of going the other direction. We're encouraging people to to spend more. So again, I think the regulators That's have tremendous small. power here to help people, help consumers to do the right thing and prevent fintechs from sort of driving the wrong habits and steering the ship towards, you know, positive habits of spending less, saving more and investing more. Yeah, that's absolutely phenomenal goal that you've shared with us today. Thank you so much for being a guest. If our listeners want to reach out and get in touch with you, they want to know a little bit more about what Bamboo does, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, you can definitely look me up on LinkedIn. I'm very active there. Other than that, you can obviously uh, check out the Bamboo website. So that's B-A-M-B-U dot C-O. That's where you can find us and, and contact us if you're interested. And I promise I'll put all the details um, in the show notes as well. So it'll be easy for people to find that stuff. But thank you so much for sharing. And I look forward to hearing about your success and having you on to speak about how Save Now, Buy Later is going to go. Thanks, Ronald. Pleasure. 